This is an XG Boost model, and this is Wimbledon, the most prestigious, famous, and fanciest tennis tournament in the world. And in this video, I will attempt to predict Wimbledon 2025 and see if I can beat IBM, who are also predicting Wimbledon. However, I have a problem. You see, I already made a video predicting tennis matches, and I used this awesome tennis dataset by Jeff Sackman. It has data about the percentage of first serve, the second serve, aces, points one on first serve. It has everything you could wish for in a dataset. It's perfect. But it doesn't have any data for 2025. We're pretty much missing six months of data, which is bad if you want to predict Wimbledon. Like trying to win a tennis match without a tennis racket, bad. So I did what any rational person would do and spend four days and a large part of my mental health scraping 6,917 tennis matches. At first, I tried scraping data from official tennis websites and guess what? That sucked. It was incomplete and it was super hard to adapt to all my other data. But then I discovered the holy grail of tennis websites, tennisabstract.com which is owned by the GOAT himself, Jeff Sackman. Thank you so much, Jeff. I, I don't know what I would do without you. And let's just say that after three days, some web scraping magic and a few 4 a.m. bedtimes, I have all the data that we'll need. The absolutely insane French Open final between Sinner and Alcaraz that made my fitness tracker think I was having a heart attack for five hours straight. Yeah, I got it. I've got every single match from the Kiagli 1 Open played in Rwanda the 24th of February of 2025. It, it's kind of random, but I also have that. The point Point is, I have plenty of data. But there is one more problem. In my last video, I said my model got 83% accuracy. Well, turns out I made a huge mistake. I had data leakage. Oh, How no, could this that's be? horrible. Yup. Data leakage is when you accidentally give information to your model that it shouldn't know. Basically, you're trending on the test set. It's like going to the casino and knowing more or less what's gonna happen. It's not great. In my case, I was giving some stats to the model that it shouldn't know before the match. Like, for example, the ELO ratings updated after the match. Now, making this mistake in front of 1.1 million people, thank you for watching by the way, is kind of really freaking embarrassing. So I remade the entire project pretty much from scratch so this doesn't happen ever again. I went from this yucky and gross super long Jupyter notebook to this beauty. Look at my baby, it, it's perfect. Okay, here's the game plan. My goal in this video is to beat IBM. I discovered that Wimbledon partnered with IBM to make predictions on all of their matches. The goal is to be better than them. I want to crush them, destroy them. I'm talking Roger Federer in his prime level destruction. I actually kind of like IBM. They have some pretty sick ML Explainer YouTube videos, but for this video and this video only, they are my arch nemesis. Cool, so this is done, but before we predict Wimbledon, you gotta understand how XG Boost works, because it's so cool. Okay, so for those who didn't watch my last video, here's a 15 second recap on decision trees and random forest. A decision tree works by asking a series of yes and no questions. Each one chose to split the data in the most useful way until it reaches a final prediction. Say you want to predict if someone likes potatoes. You get a bunch of data, train a decision tree, and then just follow the questions down the tree until you reach a leaf node with a prediction. But one tree can be unstable, so Random Forest built a bunch of trees on random subsets of data and features, and then combines their boats for a stronger, more reliable result. Cool, but here's where XGBoost comes in. You see, in a random forest, each tree is trained independently on a subset of the data and the feature. But in XG Boost, each new tree is trained sequentially. Basically, each tree fixes the mistakes of the previous ones. This process is called gradient boosting. The model builds trees one after another, with each tree focusing on reducing the errors of the combined previous trees. In fact, XG Boost actually means extreme gradient boosting because it's extreme. You've got parallel tree construction, sparsity aware split finding, L1 and L2 regularization, and much, much more. It's optimized, it overfits less, it's just awesome. Let's quickly build one from scratch so you get the idea. We'll use the Titanic dataset, a small dataset containing information about people who were in the Titanic disaster, and we'll try to predict if someone survived based on their data. XGBoost starts with an initial guess. To keep things simple, we'll set it to zero, which corresponds to a 50% probability of surviving for everyone. Now we train our forest tree using the variables that best split the data. Voila! Beautiful. Now you'll notice that if we traverse a tree and arrive at a leaf node, its leaf value is not a probability, it's an adjustment on the log odd scale. It's a tiny nudge to the starting guess. XGBoost begins by guessing 50% probability for everyone and each tree leaf adds a small push up or down. If we were to predict using this very simple model, we would sum the starting margin 0 from the first guess plus 0 0.3, which is kind of like a learning rate, times whatever the output of the first tree is. 
this. Then you convert this back to a probability and you have your prediction. This model is going to be awful because with only one tree, we only give a small nudge in the right direction, but it's not enough. So let's train more trees. And here's where the coolest part comes in. To build the next tree, we're going to take into account the prediction of all the previous trees. So the next tree learns from the mistakes of all the previous ones. This is the beauty of gradient boosting. And if you do this, say, a hundred times, you get a pretty good model. It's actually so good that a lot of people win a ton of Kaggle competitions by just using XGBoost. Okay, time to predict Wimbledon. First things first, we need to organize all this data. In machine learning, you usually have a training set with which you train the model and a validation set with which you tune the hyperparameters to improve performance. Finally, you have a test set which you're only supposed to use once to see how good your model is. In our case, the training set will be all tennis data I've got from 2000 to 2024. Then the validation set will be this year's 2025 tennis data so far and we'll use Wimbledon as the actual test set. During training, we're going to pass all kinds of stats to the model so it learns to make good predictions. For example, the player's ELO, which is basically a number that represents how good a player is. We're also going to pass all these other stats, like surface-specific ELO, average first search percentage, etc, etc. To start with, I just trained a basic model, this time hopefully without any data leakage, and I locked in my predictions for round one of Wimbledon. And while the first round matches are being played, I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. They're super awesome, so listen up. Brilliant is an online learning platform for computer science, science, and math. They have been supporting this channel for a long time and have some of the best education computer science courses on the internet. I've actually gotten super addicted to the courses, as you can see by my 57 day streak. They make learning fun by giving you puzzles and little games to test your understanding. They have courses on a lot of interesting stuff, but my favorite so far is a short course called How Technology Works. They explain how video compression, GPS, and computer memory works, and a lot of other cool stuff. I also took this AI course and it was super fun as well. So if you want to help me keep making videos and learn some pretty cool stuff, click the link in the description for a 30 day free trial and a 20% discount on the annual premium subscription. They have been super patient with me because you know, this video was supposed to come out in July. So please go check them out. Okay, the first round results for Wimbledon are in and I have some good news and some bad news. Bad news is that I got 61% match winner accuracy on the first round. Good news is that after looking at the official Wimbledon website and if I didn't miscount, IBM got 55% accuracy. So we're not doing that bad. There are also some factors that could have affected the results. First, it was the hottest day in Wimbledon history. And second, there were a lot of upsets. All these cracked players lost in the first round against relatively low ranked players. My model doesn't know that much about these low ranked players. The only statistics I'm giving to my model at the moment all are from ATP matches. Basically the highest level of tennis you can play at. But when a player comes from the challenger tour or hasn't played that many ATP matches, my model barely knows anything about them. For example, in the second round, Carlos Alcaraz, my favorite player, will play against Oliver Tarbet. Here's the statistics my model knows about Alcaraz, and this is what it knows about Tarbet. This is a problem. Luckily, I have a lot of data about qualifiers that I got while scraping, so let's feed that into the model and see if it performs better in the second round. Well, it didn't help that much. In fact, IBM won this round. They got 68% accuracy, while I only got 62. Now, to be honest, I think my model got a bit unlucky. For the most part, it was pretty similar to IBM's predictions, as you can see here, except in two occasions. In the match between Jaume Munar and Fabian Marofan, and in the match between Pedro Martinez and Mariano Nabone. However, I also made a tiny mistake. I trained on all data, that means ATP matches and also challenger matches. However, I'm only trying to predict ATP matches, so I think this is confusing my model. I ended up testing on my validation set, remember this is only the 2025 data so far, and the model performed better when it was trained on ATP matches. However, it performed even better if I only trained on ATP matches, but I also gave the model the statistics of both ATP and the challenger matches. It's kind of confusing, but I did these changes for the third round and jackpot, I got 75% accuracy and IBM, my beloved archenemy, only got 50 
96%. Let's go. Now, I probably got a bit lucky here. Uh, on the validation set, my accuracy is actually 67%. So 75% is above what I normally expect. Of course, as we move rounds, the sample size of matches get smaller and smaller. In the first round, you've got 64 matches to predict. So there is more room for the law of large numbers to smooth things out. But by the third round, we're down to just 16 matches. One bad call can swing your accuracy by several percentage points. Okay, time for the fourth round, quarterfinal and semifinal. And before locking in my predictions, I made a ton of changes. First, I web scraped statistics from the previous rounds at Wimbledon, which is easier said than done. I had to scrape multiple websites, merge several data sets. It was kind of a nightmare. But if someone's mashing aces like crazy, I want my model to know. Nicolas Harry, for example, is having the tournament of his life. He beat three top 100 players and he's ranked 143. He's kind of messing up my accuracy, I can't lie. I also did a lot of hyperparameter tuning using the validation data as you can see here. The number of frees, the learning rate, and some regularization parameters, for example. I also trained the model with all of these other stats that for some reason I was not calculating before. But the biggest change I made was in the way I calculate ELO ratings. There is a little term in the ELO formula called the K-factor. The K-factor basically decides how much the rating should change after each game. A bigger K causes bigger jumps and a smaller one makes smaller ones. Before, I was setting this to be always 24, which is standard. However, we can improve this. For example, if a player has played a lot of matches, then we probably have a good estimation of his ELO, so we want the K-factor to be lower. And if a player hasn't played that many matches, then it's probably a good idea to keep the K-factor higher. And we can actually do this by using this handy little formula they use in chess. I also made it so that if a player takes a long break, we increase the K-factor. After these and some other changes, I locked in my predictions and the results were pretty good. IBM did beat us in the fourth round, but besides that, it was pretty neck and neck. Keep in mind that in these rounds, there were hardly any upsets and only a few games were being played. So that's why the accuracy is so high, but it's still a win. And before I knew it, it was the 2025 Wimbledon final. Carlitos Alcaraz versus Janik Sinner. And just a little reminder, these two guys are cracked. They have the highest ELO ratings at the moment. And the last time they played was probably one of the best tennis matches I've ever seen. Now, I can't lie, I was rooting for my boy Carlitos, my favorite player, so I was kind of glad that my model predicted a 52% chance for Alcaraz versus 48% for Sinner. However, there is a big problem. Both the betting odds and IBM's predictions were in favor of Sinner, so it's going to be tight. The match started and Sinner took an early break in the first set, but Alcaraz came back with two breaks and won the first set in spectacular fashion. Let's go. However, Sinner broke Alcaraz's serve and took the second set. It's a tie. But Sinner also took the third and after some insane points, he also took the fourth set and won the match. I was rooting for Alcaraz, but honestly, Sinner deserves it. He's an incredible player. And yeah, it seems like the IBM model was better in the final, but I have good news. Although my model lost in the final, on average, across all the matches at Wimbledon, it performed better than the IBM model. They had 63.8% match winner accuracy and my model had 66.3. Let's freaking go. I also downloaded the betting odds for Wimbledon and the bookies had a 72% match winner accuracy. So yeah, we're we're still pretty far away from the infinite money glitch. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoy it and sorry for kind of disappearing for five months. Hopefully my next upload will be soon. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.